Hi guys, welcome to the Economic Circle. I'm Dr. Alex Mosley. Today I'm in my garden recording this. It's a beautiful mid-spring morning in England, the Midlands. A um, little bit cool when the wind blows up, hence my um, gilet or jacket, whatever you call it. And in this issue, in this article, what I'll be doing is introducing the accelerator theory. This is part of a series I'll be rolling out on the A to Z of basic concepts in economics. If there's anything you want to hear about or learn about, send a note on the YouTube video below or email directly on info at economiccircle.co. Sorry info at econcircle.co. I'll put that in a message below. And uh, just let me know if there's anything you want to hear. Okay, you'll be hearing bird noise as I record this because they're out and it's springtime. Okay, thanks for listening, guys. See you later. Bye. Hi, this is the analysis of the accelerator theory, part of our series that will be building up on the A to Z of basic economic concepts. Now, the basic idea here is that the accelerator theory investments is an attempt to explain what happens when consumer demand for a product increases and its effect on the capital goods industry and how that may also relate to business cycles that we experience. We'll be looking at the basic mechanism and then examine what may be wrong with the theory. Now, the model begins by assuming that a company has a fixed number of machines in operation and is selling a similar amount of produce yearly. It then experiences an increase in demand for its produce, which necessitates an increase in capital investment to produce the goods. Makes sense. This increased quantity in machine purchases is, however, according to the accelerator theory, a magnified percentage of the increased quantity in demand. So this goes through a numerical example. This is the sort of thing that you get examined on in economics courses and that you should be able to replicate them either for multiple choice or short answers. So imagine a factory producing... 1,000 a cars a year with X amount of engineers and 10 machines. Now, it's interesting that the quantity of labourers is not part of what we're looking at in this model. They're assumed to be fixed, which is interesting. Now, each machine is therefore capable of contributing to the production of 100 cars. Makes sense. 1,000 divided by 10 is 100. Now, one machine is to be replaced annually, so capital demand runs at one machine per year. Uh, and this is the important aspect of this, that one machine is being demanded each year to replace the one that's just um, been depreciated uh, so it can't produce any more cars. Now let's assume that demand for cars increases to 1,200 a year. This represents a 20% increase in consumer demand. But the demand for machines increases from one machine in the year to an extra two machines to help produce the extra cars, right, required by the marketplace. The mathematical essence of the accelerator theory can thus be shown. So the increase in the capital goods demand goes from 1 to 3, which represents a 200% increase, a 200% increase in capital goods demand for that year. However, if we assume that demand remains stable at 1,200 after that, the company will return to its normal replacement rate of one machine per year. And so capital goods demand will fall from three machines back down to one. So doing a quick calculation, this represents a 66% decrease in capital goods demand. Ooh! Accordingly, from what we see from the accelerator model, Capital investment demand has been catapulted from one machine a year through a 200% increase in demand, followed by a 60% decrease in demand. Now, these fluctuations, supporters of the theory argue, cause the crises that we witness in modern economies, i.e. the business cycle. So here's a quick graph showing that, that both consumer demand and capital goods demand are going at zero percentage change each year. And suddenly there's a little blip in consumer demand, 20%. This is obviously not to scale. This necessitates a 200% increase in capital goods demand following the red line, which as consumer demand follows uh, down to a 0% increase the following year, capital goods demand drops 66% before they return to um, normal 0% changes the year afterwards. Whoa, this is the accelerator model, that there's been an acceleration in the demand for capital goods. Makes sense so far. Right, now before we look at the problems, dun, 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 a note from the sponsors, i.e. the Economic Circle, my company. 
If you check out Apple Newsstand or Google Play, you'll find our monthly digital magazine. In that magazine, we cover uh, each month I bring in contributing writers to look at a specific issue. So sovereign debt, uh, the BRICS, uh, deflation we've covered. I'm looking at the origins of money in the latest issue. We've also looked at how to improve your economic thinking for exams. That's an entire issue and more coming along. If you're studying introductory economics and you want something to complement the lessons that you're going to, or if you're studying it online, I've produced over 120 videos covering much of the introductory course material on economics-circle.com. Check us out there. You can also check the Economic Circle out and join in debate on our Facebook page. Keep comments civil. <laughs> Please put your name, because then that puts us into the arena in the same position, rather than hiding behind some alien avatar that you've created. Right, good stuff. Moving back to the accelerator theory. There are problems with the theory. Firstly, it arbitrarily assumes that the time period involved is one year. Why do we do that? In most of economics, we're very flexible as to what the time period is. We look at the short run and long run, but we're not using accounting terms. We're using arbitrary periods or flexible periods that are dependent on the industry. Accordingly, the time period we should be looking at with this industry is 10 years. That is, let's say, the life cycle of the machine, of a single machine, rather than looking at a single year. In that case, when we redo the figures, <coughs> the increase in capital demand actually drops back down into line with the increase in consumer demand for the cars. In other words, it's not that exciting. Secondly, there's no slack assumed in the system. Now, most companies can cope with an increase in demand as they tend not to run at 100% capacity all the time. Also, we can offer overtime to the engineers to work extra hours and use the machines that they do have for longer periods, instead of working 9 to 5, working till 6 or 7, paying them accordingly. Similarly, this is a comment to come back to, entrepreneurs in the company have to ascertain whether the increase in demand is actually permanent or temporary. Mm. Thirdly, because of that, the accelerator model presumes that the entrepreneurs are reacting wildly to a demand signal, that they run out and buy capital goods, and that they do not change the prices of the cars. There's an increase in demand. What normally happens when there's an increase in demand? We put the prices up. And the entrepreneurs are not looking ahead to assess whether the increase in capital expenditure is actually worth it to them. So in many respects, the model is what we call mechanistic. It's almost like, um, uh, no disrespect to engineers, but an engineer's or a physicist's view of markets, sort of a static view. Whereas entrepreneurs are aware that changes in demand can be temporary and that their success as entrepreneurs is dependent on reading markets and the movements rather than just reacting to what's happening immediately. Fourthly, the theory engages in a common fallacy in economics that what happens to a single firm must be happening to the entire economy. Now this is just a complete logical fallacy. It's silly, right? Microeconomics and Austrian theorists are very good at exploding this myth, this fallacy, and reviewing and emphasizing the interconnectedness of markets. For example, if a company if the, far, uh, the, the car company experiences an increase in demand, customers may be simultaneously reducing their demand for other products, for example, holidays abroad for that year. Accordingly, the expansion in capital investment in the car industry or the car company will occur with a decrease in investment going into the holiday industry. There's just a shift of resources, right? The only way that both industries could experience an increase in capital investment is for purchases of other consumer goods to fall in order to increase the savings or the retained profits in the industries to finance the capital purchases. In other words, if there's going to be an increase in the capital stock, we must give up something now. This is basic economics, but it's often forgotten, especially in models like the accelerator theory or Keynesian economics, where they assume that C, consumption, can just increase. How? What are you giving up? What are you giving up? Savings or savings can increase at the same time as consumption. Uh, not really. Fifthly, the model also assumes that capital goods can be produced instantaneously. Now, this is a very strange, i.e. unrealistic assumption, akin to people playing the game of Monopoly and wanting to buy a hotel. Uh, here you go, says the banker, here's your hotel. That's instantaneous. But in reality, capital goods may take a while to acquire. Hence, economists' description of the short versus long run is flexible. 
For example, a con computer operator, somebody running a server or whatever, or a web design company, can run down to a local computer store and set up with a new computer within an hour or so. That's their long run. Wow. But a car factory may have to wait several months for a new machine to be built. Again, this underlines the arbitrariness of just using one year time period in the theory or the model, as well as the assumption of entrepreneurs being reactive rather than entrepreneurial. Again, very mechanistic and quite unrealistic. Finally, as for being an explanation of the business cycle, it completely ignores the monetary sector, the monetary effects and alterations in the interest rates, real interest rates if you were, by central banks, and the entire edifice of mo modern monetary pyramids, i.e. fractional reserve banking. It's almost as if it's missing the elephant in the room. Oh, look at this increase in capital demand. It's very interesting, isn't it? But everybody's pointing out, well, actually, interest rates have dropped and there's a huge amount of credit being created in the banking system. I'm not interested in that. Well, if you're not interested in that, you're not doing economics. You're not connecting markets together and looking at the monetary effects of credit creation. And that's where, really, the business cycle comes from. Anyway, accordingly, the focus of the accelerator model is more on the symptoms rather than causes. Arguably, its description of the symptoms fails, and therefore the causal theory of the business cycle fails. Just as mechanistic theories of physiology fail, the mechanistic accelerator theory fails too. This is an analogy. The market, like the body, is organic and constantly adapting to its environment. But unlike the body, entrepreneurs in the marketplace are forward-looking as well as innovative and experimental. And this makes economics much more interesting than simple mechanistic theories. Make sense? Right, here follows an advertisement for the Economics Circle magazine, which is online through Apple Newsstand and Google Plus Play. Thanks for listening, guys. Enjoy the videos. Bye now.